Welcome, my name is Jan Libich and I'm really pleased to be joined by Dr. Uh, Stephen Kirchner uh, from the University of Technology Sydney as well as affiliated with the Centre for Independent Studies in Sydney uh, that kindly provided these uh, premises. Today we'll be talking about a very hot topic, uh, we'll be talking about fiscal sustainability or maybe fiscal unsustainability. So Stephen, can you please uh, uh, summarize the situation for us? What's wrong with fiscal policy uh, across the globe? Well, I think part of the problem with fiscal policy is that it's not focused on what it's good at. So when you're looking at tax policy and expenditure policy, really that should be driven by microeconomic considerations. So you want uh, policies that create good incentives for working, saving and investing. Uh, you want policies that stack up on a cost-benefit basis. Unfortunately, what tends to happen is politicians use fiscal policy for macroeconomic reasons. So they're using it either to stimulate or restrain economic activity. And that's something that fiscal policy is not particularly good at. And it diverts the attention of politicians away from those microeconomic considerations. Okay, so this is, this is kind of a, a big picture problem, but it seems that there's more to it than that. It seems that fiscal policy in, in most countries is on an unsustainable path. Uh, and why would that be? I mean, if, mm. if it's only about macroeconomic considerations, mm. about, mm. you know, smoothing the, the cycle, then it should be kind of, it should cancel out on average over the business cycle and we shouldn't have that problem. Mm. So what's driving that? Yeah, so there's an issue around fiscal sustainability in that we know politicians have an incentive to spend more than they're bringing in in terms of revenue at any particular time. And in a sense, uh, Keynesian economics provides an intellectual justification for doing something that politicians have a temptation to do anyway, uh, and that's to spend beyond their means. Um, so what's the incentive there? Or what's, what's driving that? Well, it's, it's an electoral incentive that you want to... Uh, politicians feel that if they're uh, spending on things that are politically popular, this will help them get re-elected, and then they can send the bill to future generations in terms of uh, rising debt. So, so, but ultimately, it must mean that the that the voters are somehow, you know, not fully informed or not fully rational to be buying that sort of uh, those sort of promises and those those sort of. Uh, suboptimal behaviour or suboptimal policies? Well, there's a big question about how forward-looking voters actually are. So there's the idea of Ricardian equivalence, which says that voters recognise that current government spending uh, that's unfunded uh, equals higher future taxes. And so when the government announces an unfunded fiscal stimulus, effectively what it's doing is announcing a future tax increase. And if voters anticipate that to some degree, then they're going to respond to that by increasing their level of saving, which of course makes the fiscal stimulus less effective. So empirically, it's an interesting question as to how big that effect is. Uh, and empirically, the, it doesn't seem to work, and there's some mm. good reasons why you should deviate from well, uh, yeah. uh, you know, borrowing constraints and as well as myopic mm. voters mm. and these sort of yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, the literature in Australia would suggest that there is a, a Ricardian offset to, to government spending, which blunts the effectiveness of, of fiscal policy. Mm. But that's, I mean, the, the big picture is, is really the, the demographic changes that, mm. you know, uh, imply that, that the future is, is going to be even mm. more challenging than dealing with the, the, with the past uh, mm -hmm. fiscal. So can you just outline what's, what's happening on the demographic front uh, in, in most developed mm. countries? So we have the baby boom generation hitting retirement age uh, starting round about now. And so this leads to an increase in the age dependency ratio, the number of uh, old people relative to the number of people who are still in the workforce. And these and, are kind of massive changes, right? Uh, going from yeah, you know, five, it, six workers per, per pensioner to uh, close to two or even mm, one in some yeah. countries. It is a large change, but there is, of course, a precedent for this, which is in the early post-war period, you had a big increase in the age dependency ratio on the part of those aged between zero to 16. So this is when the, the baby boomers were, were children. Yeah. Um, and that didn't lead to a significant fiscal problem because the welfare state was much better contained in the early post-war period and government spending was more under control than it is now. Um, so a big increase in the age dependency ratio in itself is not necessarily a problem. What's a problem is the unsustainable public expenditures that we have attached to this ageing population. So, so my view would be that you need to tackle this unsustainable expenditure profile. 
So let's let's just try to put some numbers. I mean, if you, if you think about the United States currently, um, the the deficit uh, to GDP ratio is, is mm. about eight or nine, which mm. doesn't seem like a big number. But when you mm. when you uh, you know, it's probably not a fair comparison because the government doesn't actually own own the GDP. So if you if you think about the the dollars that they spent out of three dollars that that it's spending one it's actually borrowing and mm. and uh, probably an even better comparison is to say that that if you if the if you think of revenue being 100 then the expenditure is actually 160 so so the mm. deficit as a proportion of the, the government revenues is actually 60 mm. uh, percent so it's uh, th these are kind of really big numbers uh, mm -hmm. w would that be across the board would other countries also face this this kind of um, uh, shortfalls and and also not not just now but but thinking about the future. Mm. Uh, well, if you look at the U.S., the U.S. was actually running budget surpluses up until the late 1990s, and then yeah, and then you had the recession in 2001, which sent the U.S. economy into deficit, and the budget position it uh, really didn't recover, and then we went into the global financial crisis and a very severe economic downturn. Uh, which has worsened the fiscal position. I think if you look around the world, the, the countries that have the worst fiscal policy outcomes are the countries that have had uh, the worst recessions. So there's a big cyclical component to this. And it's actually hard to separate out the cyclical and, and the structural component. Uh, it's, uh, there's, there's an IMF paper, I think from 2009, that, that calculates the, the cost of the crisis in terms of you know, per, per, uh, as a proportion of GDP, and compares it to the impact of of the demographics of the aging populations, and, mm. and it finds that in, in most industrial countries, the crisis is only about ten percent the cost of the impact mm. on 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 the fiscal position of, mm. of the aging population, which is in the order of four four five hundred percent of of GDP. So mm. the the worst is really yet yet to come. Mm. Uh, but thinking about uh, uh, thinking about the, the, the possible solutions, so um, what is there to be done? And you, you actually have a proposal with your colleague Robert Carling, I think, uh, about reforming some of the uh, fiscal legislation. So mm -hmm. what is it all about? Yeah, so that proposal was in the Australian context. Uh, if you look around the world, there are a number of countries in the 1990s that introduced fiscal responsibility legislation. So we had that in Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, uh, many of the Scandinavian countries adopted fiscal responsibility legislation. So essentially uh, doing what was being done with monetary policy at about approximately the same time, which is bringing in a more rules-based approach to fiscal policy. And so in Australia we had the Charter of Budget Honesty, which came into legislative force in 1998. And what that did was to lay out uh, some principles for fiscal policy but what it didn't do was to lay down some hard rules as to what fiscal policy should consist of. So it said that the government should have a fiscal strategy, but didn't actually say what that strategy should be. So what, what so, kind of strategies do you suggest? What are your rules? So what we've proposed is a more prescriptive approach to fiscal policy rules. So not just laying down the principles, but actually laying down some hard and fast enforceable rules. And so in the Australian context, we recommended firstly uh, a budget balance rule, which says that the budget balance or the fiscal balance needs to be kept within a range of uh, plus or minus 2% of GDP. And this is and a cyclically adjusted balance or just here? No, no, we, we, we see this as being an annual, an annual constraint. And, and if you look historically at the, the budget outcomes for Australia going back to say 1970, uh, you'd be able to accommodate most of the, the budget balances that we've seen uh, historically within, within that, uh, those parameters. So we also proposed a net debt rule, which is to say that net debt to GDP should not exceed 10%, uh, which again is very close to the historical average for Australia since about 1970. And then a size of a government rule. And the size of a government rule says that the uh, revenue and expenditure shares of GDP should be capped at 25%. And uh, this is in fact consistent with an existing government policy commitment which uh, the current government says that it intends to keep the taxation share or the revenue share of GDP uh, at 2007-2008 levels uh, which if you add up 
the tax and non-tax revenue shares of GDP adds up to 25%. So basically we're saying we sh you should make a legislative rule out of the government's existing policy commitment. So you, in, in other words, you, you're trying to kind of institutionalise this rather than resting with an individual government that might be replaced and, and the preferences might change. Yeah, so it's a less discretionary approach to fiscal policy and, and part of the reason for that is that we want to refocus fiscal policy back on what it's good at. So focusing on the role of tax policy and expenditure policy in conditioning microeconomic incentives and leaving macroeconomic stabilisation to monetary policy which has a comparative advantage in terms of uh, that particular objective. And so why these three specific rules? I mean there seems to be an overlap between them, right? If you're running a balanced budget you mm. shouldn't run up your debt or you shouldn't... Well, well they're designed to, to interact. So for example with the uh, budget balance rule you could actually run uh, deficits for many years in, in terms of that rule. So you for example you could have a deficit of 1.5 or 1.9% of GDP uh, every year and still be consistent with that rule. So the idea of the net debt rule is to limit how long you can do that. But, but still giving government the flexibility to run deficits for extended periods if that's necessary. Uh, so the rules are designed to, to reinforce each other. Now there's also been rules in, in the Euro area <laughs> and we know how they yep. How, how they uh, turned out to be, but as a part of the Growth and Stability Pact, the Maastricht Criteria also had some rules. So can mm -hmm. you maybe outline the, the similarities and differences uh, mm. between the European rules and the, and the so, rules? Yeah, so the Maastricht rules were designed to do two things. So firstly, lay out convergence criteria that countries had to satisfy in order to gain Euro accession. Uh, but then also to hold the Eurozone together so that you didn't have a situation where uh, fiscal policy would blow up monetary policy. Uh, and in a sense, fiscal policy rules in Australia would be designed to do the same thing. You want a fiscal policy regime that's going to support the monetary policy regime. Because we know that if a government is running irresponsible fiscal policy, then what can end up happening is the government can effectively uh, force the monetary authority to accommodate that fiscal expansion. It's the, the uh, unpleasant monitors are arithmetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so this sort of fiscal theory of the price level. Uh, so in a way you want the monetary regime and the fiscal regime to reinforce each other. Um, and so of course Australia is a monetary union and so part of what you're trying to do with a fiscal uh, regime here is to provide support for what the Reserve Bank is doing in terms of monetary policy. Now as the European example shows, it's not enough just to have the rules. You need an enforcement regime and an enforcement mechanism that actually gets used. And so do you propose anything to, to go with your rules that would enforce? We, we do, we do. Uh, I mean, the Eurozone had an enforcement mechanism as well, it's just that it wasn't used properly. So we know that in 2003 and 2004, uh, both Germany and France violated the rules and they were not held uh, accountable under the Maastricht framework for those violations and that kind of set a bad precedent which was then followed by other countries and led to the existing problems. So I think what this shows is that it's not enough just to have the rules written down. You actually need a culture that says that these rules should be enforced. Um, How do you develop a culture like that in a, well, I think part in of the, an institution yeah. that's, that's very new? Well, I think the process of just writing down the rules is one of the ways in which you can develop the culture. I mean, it's, it's a reinforcing process. Um, but, but rules by themselves, we know, uh, are not going to be enough. If, if politicians are determined to violate the rules and electorates will, don't hold politicians accountable for those violations, then no fiscal policy regime is going to be able to withstand, um, withstand that. So, uh, but I still think the rules are important because this is part of creating the culture and the accountability mechanisms that uh, you hope will restrain politicians. So what, what um, kind of rule, uh, rules or, or what kind of mm -hmm. enforceability mechanisms do you suggest? So in Australia we've proposed a, an independent fiscal commission which would conduct research into fiscal policy and monitor compliance with the rules. And uh, it would also enforce the rules in terms of imposing pecuniary penalties on members of parliament for breaching the rules.
Uh, so this would essentially be a, a fine on all members of parliament uh, if the rules were breached. Uh, and it's not because we think that politicians are necessarily going to be particularly responsive to that sort of pecuniary incentive. Uh, we see it more as a non-pecuniary incentive, which is that if you have an independent body imposing penalties on politicians, this involves a loss of reputation uh, for politicians. And, and politicians do guard their, their reputation fairly jealously. Do you um, think that something like that could work in the European context? Because we've seen yep. the, the recent uh, fiscal compact where mm. you know, most countries except two have actually committed to a, a sort of balanced mm. budget rule on a, on a kind of cyclical uh, basis. Mm. Um, but obviously there's no accountability procedure as yet. Uh, well, the Maastricht Treaty did have those provisions. So there was provision to fine countries who, who breached the rules. And it was the... You can't keep anyone uh, out of that. Well, yeah, well, this is part of the problem that um, uh, you, they're, they're trying to hold the, the Eurozone together and this makes it difficult to impose mm -hmm. discipline uh, upon the members. Um, so the Maastricht Treaty did have a, a, a penalty and enforcement regime. It's just that this regime has not been rigorously applied. And of course, this has led to the, the problems that we now see. So on the one hand, it shows that there are limits to the effectiveness of these rules. But on the other hand, it highlights the importance of adhering to the rules. Uh, because then you can have a situation where fiscal policy essentially uh, undermines not only fiscal sustainability, but as we've seen in the Eurozone, uh, potentially compromising monetary policy as well. So how would it work in practice? I mean, suppose you have an independent uh, fiscal commission, and I suppose you would model it as a, a as, a, as an independent central bank type of uh, institution. Mm -hmm. So what would happen if they come up with an intergenerational report, you know, using uh, Kotlikov's uh, intergenerational accounting mm -hmm. uh, and found out that there's a huge fiscal gap and mm -hmm. then something needs to be done? What, how, would the, you know, how would they actually get back to the politician and, mm -hmm. and make sure that there's a change in the fiscal stance? Well, we do have intergenerational reports at the moment. Part of the problem with those reports, I think, is that they're prepared by Treasury and uh, whether justified or not, they're not seen to be independent of government. And I think this reduces the authority of those reports. And so we would expect that the Fiscal Commission, as part of its independent responsibilities, would be compiling these reports. Um, because it's an independent body, these reports would carry a little bit more authority. And, and part of what the reports would be designed to do is highlight whether or not fiscal policy is sustainable or not. Uh, now in Australia, if you go back to the 2007 uh, intergenerational report, that report said very explicitly that over a 40-year horizon there was a large fiscal gap and that this would lead to uh, unsustainable net debt dynamics. And so effectively they were saying that over a long horizon fiscal policy in Australia was unsustainable. Um, the 2010 report never used the word unsustainability. They yeah. kind of fudged it a little bit. Despite the fact uh, that the situation was looking much worse. Uh, well, actually, I, on the numbers, the situation improved a little bit between 2007 and 2010, uh, but still an unsustainable uh, situation. Uh, so part of the role of the, uh, an independent fiscal commission would be to uh, comment on the sustainability of fiscal policy um, but also to then uh, enforce the fiscal policy rules. So to say to governments, uh, you're in breach of the rules, um, here is a penalty, and this is what you need to do to, to get back on track. This is the, the magnitude of the fiscal adjustment. And that and, would be non-negotiable. Yeah. The politicians would have to comply. Well, yes. So the idea is that you would want to make these provisions enforceable. So if you look at the existing Charter of Budget Honesty in Australia, the very first provision of that legislation says that uh, nothing in the Charter of Budget Honesty will be subject to administrative or judicial review. So effectively, the existing legislation says that there's no enforcement mechanism. You, know, you can't take politicians to court to make them adhere to the rules. So we would see was, that... Was that a deliberate... Uh of course, of course, yep. So, so they're saying, we'll have these fiscal principles, but we're not going to lay down fiscal rules and we're, we're not even going to be accountable for the fiscal principles. Mm. Um, there are some countries who have gone further than Australia in, in their fiscal mm. reforms. And 
some mm. of them have implemented an independent uh, fiscal commission or a fiscal council. Mm. Some similar proposals are floated around in, mm. in Europe. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about the, the real world examples uh, that we can draw up in? Yeah, I mean, there are lots of examples. I think the, the New Zealand example is a good one. Uh, it's still the case with the New, New Zealand legislation that they, they don't prescribe so much what the fiscal strategy should be. Um, but they have very good transparency and accountability mechanisms uh, built into the legislation. Um, there are independent fiscal authorities uh, in a number of countries. Uh, the, the Netherlands, for example, is a very good uh, independent fiscal authority that looks at and evaluates um, legislation in terms of its fiscal impact uh, and does sort of cost-benefit type uh, analyses and so forth. So. I think generally speaking the sort of model that you want is one which defines the, the parameters within which fiscal policy needs to be made. Uh, I don't think you can have a situation where you have a, an independent body telling politicians what expenditure decisions and what taxation decisions they're going to make. Because they're necessarily political decisions mm, and, course, and governments are not going to surrender um, their responsibility for those. Uh, but what you can do is put uh, parameters around the, the uh, budget aggregates and net debt position and so on. And I think this serves a number of purposes. The first being that you're, you're kind of taking the politics out of those parameters. Um, so the idea that fiscal policy should be conducted sustainably should not be something that's up for political debate. I mean, this should be a, a settled issue. And I, I see nothing wrong with forcing politicians to make decisions that are consistent with uh, long-run fiscal sustainability. So that's one element of it. The other element of it, of course, is that you want to uh, tie down the public's expectations in relation to, to fiscal policy. That's the Bigger. anchoring of fiscal expectations. Yeah, Eric yeah. Lieber has talked about that yeah, yeah. numerously. Yeah, because, I mean, we've recognised that this is very important in monetary policy, but we haven't recognised that it's important in terms of fiscal policy. Uh, because I think what makes uh, large budget deficits and unstable debt positions harmful is not so much the, the actual numbers. I mean, we know from experience that countries can actually run very large budget deficits and, and very um, large net debt positions for extended periods of time. So it's not the actual uh, existing fiscal policy that's the problem. It's the public's expectation that uh, future policy uh, is going to lead to um, serious problems. And, and that's, that's very destructive of economic confidence. So the implication is that um, a, a large part of the European problem now may be that the expectations about the future are kind of un mm -hmm. un unsettled and unanchored. And yep. if, if we had you know, some longer term reforms that may take pressures of, of you know, of the focus or of the immediate debt numbers, which, mm. I mean, if you look at Spain and Ireland, uh, the, the debt to GDP uh, of those countries up until very recently was, you know, fairly low, much lower mm. than France in, in, mm. in, in Germany. So mm. it, it does seem to be, the future seems to be playing a, a pretty major role in in this. Mm -hmm. and now, you, you mentioned the overlap with, with monetary policy and uh, mm -hmm. the, we've, we have seen similar type of reforms towards mm -hmm. independence and transparency and accountability uh, in, in monetary policy and you've done mm -hmm. quite a lot of work along that. So can you just outline what they have been and what the, mm -hmm. what the kind of similarities with fiscal policy are there mm -hmm. are that we mm -hmm. can learn? Mm -hmm. So starting in the early 1990s or in the case of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand from 1989, and the RBNZ was really a pioneer in this regard, uh, there was a move to make central banks firstly more independent of government. And this was in recognition mm. of the fact that the empirical literature seemed to suggest that the more independent a central bank was, the better the inflation outcomes. So we wanted to kind of take monetary policy out of the political arena and separate it from fiscal policy. So we want to reduce the scope for monetary policy to uh, accommodate fiscal policy. And at the same time, there was a move towards a more rules-based approach to monetary policy. So rather than just kind of making it up as you go along, um, responding to a wide range of macroeconomic variables in ways that were sometimes inconsistent 
there was a much stronger focus on uh, defining what it was that monetary policy was trying to do. And so that ended up uh, being inflation targeting. So the idea is you want to uh, target a low rate of inflation. And this has the advantage of firstly focusing monetary policy on something that it's good at. So one thing we know monetary policy can do in the medium to long run is tie down the price level. Um, so you've got monetary policy focused on a uh, policy objective where you, there's a reasonable chance of success. And this has the added advantage that to the extent that people believe that the central bank will realise this objective, then you're tying down long run inflation expectations. Uh, and if you can do that, that actually makes the job of setting monetary policy much easier because consumers and uh, other people setting prices in the economy, uh, if, they're, if, they're, if they have a cr an expectation that monetary policy will do what the central bank says it's going to do, then they're going to factor that into their price setting, their wage setting, makes the job of the monetary authority much easier. And they'll be less responsive to the shocks so the policymaker can more easily stabilise the, the situation. You, uh, you mentioned New Zealand and we, in one of our previous interviews we had uh, a Dr Don Brash, the, the first the pioneer in inflation targeting, the first uh, governor of the, of the RBNZ. Um, we, we talked about those issues and, and one of the things that, that came up again is that th these kind of rules, um, if you implement them in monetary policy, they may somehow have an impact on, on fiscal policy as well. So um, the RBNZ Act that, that came up with inflation targeting and made mo monetary policy more independent and transparent appeared in 1989 and only five years later we've seen... Um, We've seen the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Mm. So, uh, and, and Don would argue that uh, a part of it is the fact that uh, because uh, the, the central bank became more, more independent and more committed, that kind of forced the politicians to, to realize that they can no longer use fiscal policy for their, you know, for their idiosyncratic political goals. Mm. Uh, mm. Would, you, would you believe that that's, that's a possible mechanism there between monetary, mm. you know, commitment and, and maybe fiscal outcomes? Uh, mm. Yeah, as we said before, you want the, the fiscal regime and the monetary regime to support each other. And so part of the problem in the United States, I think, has been that uh, firstly, the, the Federal Reserve has a dual mandate. So it's pursuing not only price stability, but it has uh, a mandate to uh, stabilize activity as well. Uh, and so this has led to a monetary policy that's perhaps not been as focused on inflation as it should be. And there's, you, there's a lot of empirical literature that shows that regardless of whether you have a dual mandate or, mm. or, a, or, or a unitary mandate with a focus on inflation, mm. uh, the uh, uh, central banks have pretty much behaved in the, in the same fashion if you look at the Reserve mm. Bank of New Zealand and the Reserve Bank of Australia mm. and, and all these other, the Swedish Riksbank. Mm. So, so well, it's partly the way they've interpreted the mandate. So if you interpret the mandate to say that the best way to secure price stability is to uh, smooth economic activity, or if you, if you look at um, economic activity as essentially predicting what's going to happen with inflation in the short run and responding to that, then there's a sense in which you can make that mandate compatible. And I think that's how, for example, the Reserve Bank of Australia, uh, which also has a, a, a multi-variable mandate, if you like, uh, the way the Reserve Bank of Australia would interpret it would be that, well, activity gives us information about what's going to happen with inflation in the future. And if that's your interpretation of the mandate, then you, know, you can reconcile those objectives. Um, but what I think we've seen in the US and in, in Europe recently is increasingly you've had monetary accommodation of fiscal policy. Um, and in the United States, this has happened because you don't have a well-defined monetary or fiscal policy regime. Uh, and in Europe, although you have this reasonably well-defined regime on paper, it's not being respected in practice. Now, if, if, if we think about the accountability we, we mentioned as an important element of fiscal reforms, how, how is it solved in, uh, in terms of monetary policy? In, in some countries, for example, mm -hmm. New Zealand, the, the governor is personally accountable mm -hmm. for achieving mm -hmm. the inflation target on, on average. Mm -hmm. Can you think of a parallel in, in the fiscal arena? Uh, uh, again, what, you know, how would that accountability work? 
Yeah, I think the accountability mechanisms basically have to be reputational in nature. Uh, you can add a pecuniary element to it as well with fines, but um, I don't think fines uh, will necessarily uh, do the job by themselves. Certainly in, uh, in British Columbia, in Canada, there's a regime where provincial politicians uh, can have their salaries reduced significantly if they breach the fiscal rules. Um, so I think it's say 30%, they take a 30% pay cut uh, while the state's finances are in breach of those rules. Oh, really? um, um, that's, that's not a bad, bad incentive and, and you want to make that incentive legally enforceable as well. Um, so that's kind of the, the model that we have in mind, but I think the probably the better sort of accountability mechanism is just a, a reputational one, where you have a well-respected independent body essentially oversighting what politicians are doing in terms of fiscal policy. And when they're in breach of the fiscal policy rules, you want the independent body um, basically criticising them and imposing these penalties as well. Um, because then politicians have to go to the electorate and um, justify their record um, with this hanging over them. And they don't want that. They want to be able to go to the electorate and say, oh, we've done a good job. They don't want to go to the electorate with a, an independent body saying that they've done a bad job. Uh, so I think that's the, the mechanism that you need to uh, enforce fiscal policy rules. And it's kind of the mechanism that's been lacking in most jurisdictions. So, so assuming that we implement fiscal rules, uh, um, how about the, you know, the implementation? If, if we go back to the, uh, the demographic changes that are really driving the, mm -hmm. the fiscal problem, what, what it seems to me to imply to me is that if you have a, a balanced budget rule, it means that as your uh, population ages and the tax revenue uh, shrinks as, and the expenditures both on pensions and health care is mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. going through the roof, uh, a politician that doesn't implement any systemic long term reform, every mm -hmm. year they're going to be faced with a situation that they have a budgetary shortfall. And they will have to subscribe to some very, you know, uh, non-systemic and, and short-sighted uh, cuts, which is mm. kind of what we're seeing in Europe now, I, I mm. think, with mm. all these austerity mm. measures. It's not really, you know, long-term uh, reforms mm. uh, that, that aim at the aging population problem, but it's all kind of short-term cuts. And th mm. these can be counterproductive. So uh, would you agree that we do need to, to, to be able to deliver uh, these rules? We actually do need reforms of, of pensions as well as mm. health care. Uh, and, and how, how do we do that? But I think having rules and an independent enforcement mechanism thereby creates the technology that politicians can use as a commitment device. So politicians can say, we have these rules, and we have this oversight body enforcing these rules, and the politician can say, well, I'm being forced to make these decisions because this is what the law requires me to do. So it kind of strengthens the hand of politicians who want to pursue responsible policies. And so in terms of the intergenerational reports, part of the function of those things is just to highlight the fact that fiscal policy in the long run in countries including Australia is unsustainable. And so you then want policy decisions that are going to put us back onto a sustainable path. I think there's an example of this working in Australia in the sense that uh, in recent years the federal government has raised, uh, introduced measures which are going to raise the age at which people become eligible for the old age pension. Uh, so those rules don't come into force uh, for some time, um, but they're now uh, legislated and so uh, politicians have effectively said we, we know we're on an unsustainable path in terms of public expenditure, so these are the measures that we're now putting in place to try and improve that long-term fiscal uh, profile. So, so here you have the intergenerational reports uh, directly informing current policy decisions, and that's kind of what you want. But I mean, Australia has actually implemented a, a much bigger reform of the pension system uh, mm. about two decades ago, where it moved from a, a pay-as-you-go system, mm. where you pay for the current pensions with current taxation, to a more like individual account type of uh, mm. uh, scheme. Can you outline uh, what, what this reform was about and how, whether it's been working? Well, I think we have two advantages in terms of pension policy in Australia. So firstly, we don't have a universal pension. We have a, a means-tested pension. 
So not everyone is eligible for the pension. And that puts Australia in a very strong fiscal position on that score relative to, say, a country like New Zealand, where the pension is a universal entitlement. Uh, so that's an important aspect of it. The other uh, important aspect was to uh, create a system whereby uh, individuals uh, would have pension accounts or superannuation accounts uh, and the government mandates that a certain percentage of people's incomes uh, goes into those accounts. And so you have a pre-funding of uh, retirement obligations. And part of the rationale for doing that is to reduce the demands on the old age pension in future. Because if you have people with large superannuation account balances, uh, you're essentially going to be dealing them out of age pension eligibility uh, down the track. Um, I think there are still a lot of problems with that system. Uh, one of the problems uh, being that there's an incentive for people to take their superannuation benefits as a lump sum, uh, spend it on a, a new home or, or something like that, and then become eligible for the age pension. Uh, there's nothing to prevent people at this stage from doing that. Um, so I think we need to look at not only what happens in the accumulation stage, but what happens in the decumulation stage. Um, and so there have been a number of uh, very good proposals put forward by people like uh, Jeff Kingston, uh, Hazel Bateman and John Piggott, uh, which says that you want to put in place a regime of uh, mandatory annuitisation of retirement benefits mm -hmm. as well. So basically having the government mandate the form in which you take your superannuation benefits, again with a view to minimising age pension eligibility. Um, so I, I, think we've, uh, I think the retirement income system that we have in Australia is good by international standards, but the international standards is a very low one. Um, so, so, so I think we still have work to do in terms of, um, you know, in an absolute sense, improving our system. But if we were to summarise the, the advantages of an individual kind of saving account schemes. Uh, it, it seems the, the main benefit is that people have an idea how much they've saved up and they can make better decisions uh, mm -hmm. um, with, you know, whether they're going to save, save a little bit more on the side mm -hmm. or so on. Whereas yeah. with countries with a, with a universal pay-as-you-go system, uh, the current young uh, are, are obviously contributing to the system, but they're very un unsure about, you know, how much they're going to get back. Uh, yeah. Yep. So, so this transparency yes. and, and again this, this anchoring is, is important mm -hmm. to reduce mm -hmm. the uncertainty and, and improve decisions of yep. economic agents. Yeah, so if you look at the United States, for example, in the US people pay social security taxes, uh, the government takes that money and then spends it. Mm -hmm. um, and the social security liabilities that the United States is accruing are largely unfunded. And this is part of their, the, the problem in terms of fiscal sustainability in the US. Well, La Larry Kotlikoff, uh, he estimates, and, and co-authors, he estimated the size of the fiscal gap in the United States, which is basically the difference between the net present value of the future expenditures implied by the existing legislation minus the, the net present value of the taxation and, you know, taking into account all the demographic trends and so on. Mm -hmm. and, and that is in the order of, you know, 220, 230 mm -hmm. uh, trillion of US dollars, which is, you know, more than 10 times more than the official uh, mm, debt mm. and you know this this is actually similar for for many countries so, so mm, the size mm. of the fiscal problem is is enormous and mm, and mm. again it, there's no wonder that the the current generations are mm. uncertain about what's going to happen in the future and then mm, that, mm. that that's not a good situation you, you want to have yeah i think it's enormously destabilizing because if you put yourself in the shoes of a u.s taxpayer uh, especially a younger taxpayer uh, I know that my tax burden is going to increase, but I don't know how much. I don't know what the distribution of that tax burden is going to be. Uh, and so how does this affect my decisions to save and invest? Well, it probably makes me reluctant to, to save and invest because I might be setting myself up for a much higher tax burden uh, in the future. Uh, so, but on the other hand, the, these numbers are so bad that in a sense it tells you that something's going to give right. So. Either politicians have to address the problem or a fiscal crisis forces them to address the problem. It might be mm. kind of very costly because once you, mm. once you get to a situation that Greece is facing now where mm. you basically mm. have to do all these very unpopular 
uh, steps uh, and you, you don't have the time to actually do a proper long term mm. reform, then a lot of uh, people are going to get hurt and and that's, mm-hmm. that's probably not what we're going to get uh, in other countries. So. Yeah, I mean, Greece is in a particular situation where they're in a monetary union and in they've got a fixed exchange rate regime effectively. And we know that if you implement a fiscal contraction in a fixed exchange rate regime, that's going to be contractionary for economic activity. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the problem with Greece is actually more being part of the euro than, than uh, the fiscal policy situation. But... Um, well, it's certainly but, true for Spain and Ireland, where mm. the, the kind of straitjacket of the euro mm. was really the, I think, the leading cause of the current problems. Mm. Because mm. again, and that's something that most people don't realize. And you know, I think Paul Krugman is one of the people that's trying to highlight it that, that mm. they have been running surpluses before the crisis. Mm. You know, they were they were not as surpluses six, on on a cyclically adjusted basis, but still mm. they, they had surpluses and relatively low uh, debt to GDP. Uh, mm. Mm. Uh, ratio. Uh, so, and the, the the problem was the housing boom that was that was really fueled by excessively low interest rates that, mm, mm. that, that they had, and, and they had them because Germany was, uh, you know, uh, in a in a contraction in the early two thousands. So, mm, so mm. the interest rates in the eurozone as a whole was were set lower than than was optimal for for countries like Spain and, and mm. Ireland. That really mm, fueled mm. the housing bubble and and. Yep. and now we're seeing the consequences. So, mm. so I agree yeah. with you that the euro is is, uh, mm. is certainly a, a factor that's mm. that's making the situation worse in Europe. Let's let's. But, but going back to the issue of uh, a, a crisis leading to bad policy, uh, I'm not convinced that that's necessarily the case. I think sometimes you can get better policy coming out of a crisis just because the situation demands it. And we saw that in a number of countries, New Zealand, for example basically had the IMF knocking at its door in the early 1980s, which led to uh, a series of dramatic reforms, which you, yeah, which you would not have seen in the absence of the crisis. Um, same in Sweden in, a, in the early 1990s. Sweden had a very severe uh, financial crisis, um, but that led Sweden to implement a number of reforms, which have meant that if you look at Sweden today, it's actually outperforming uh, most of Europe. Partly, of course, because it's out of the euro, but also because it put in place these reforms uh, many years ago. So uh, it's sad to say, but I think sometimes you get better outcomes out of a crisis mm-hmm. than you do uh, out of a situation where politicians kind of just muddle through. Going back, uh, and we're running out of time, so going back to uh, the, the individual savings accounts as, as part of the pension reform, um, they have been considered in some European countries, uh, you know, a while ago, for example, in Germany, and then they were not implemented uh, partly because there's a there's a hypothesis called an asset meltdown hypothesis that basically outlines that uh, you know if we have a strong baby boomer generation retiring and they you know they they need to fund the retirement, they're basically getting rid of the assets, they they losing value. Yep. So you know they may have saved up a lot in an individual account, but you know, the value is going to be reduced over time. And empirically, it seems there's a lot of research that shows that, you know, while there's some merit to this idea, mm-hmm. uh, empirically, it's, it's a very, it's kind of a relatively small factor. So it doesn't seem yeah, to... Yeah, I, I'm not convinced by that idea. I mean, people say this in Australia, that once the baby boomers start uh, running down their savings and selling their shares, that share prices are going to collapse. Um, but, but, you know, what are share prices that's there? It's people's expectation of the, the future earnings of the company. Exactly. It's not determined by uh, who the buyers and sellers might happen to be. Um, and so if, if uh, uh, people who are drawing down their savings are selling, well, on the other side of that transaction, you've got a buyer. You know, that buyer is looking at the future earnings prospects of the... Well, the, the idea the, is that there'll be a lot fewer buyers because the, yeah. the you know, the... Yeah, but, it's, but it's not the yeah. smaller, but, but it's not the number of buyers and sellers. It's what they're prepared to pay, right? And the prices at which they're prepared to sell. Um, and you, so, so, you, so are you arguing mm-hmm. that because there'll be fewer, you know, middle-aged people, young people, uh, the real mm-hmm. real wage is going to go up because mm-hmm. they'll be in higher demand to provide the services for the for the elderly. So so they might be, you know, they have, might have more income to actually buy. I mean, yeah. there are all sorts of mm. issues that, that we can consider. But 
Uh, mm-hmm. if, if you look at the evidence, it seems like the asset meltdown hypothesis is not really having much, much of a... Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced by that. <laughs> now, um, obviously, pensions is, uh, is one story. Healthcare is really the, the, big, the big issue. And mm-hmm. uh, unlike pensions, where we've seen some good reforms, or at least where we should be heading, um, there's, there's really no good uh, example of what, how to reform healthcare. And, mm-hmm. and again, the aging population uh, is going to... You know, this is this is where the main problem is coming from because uh, mm-hmm. uh, main part of health spending accrues in the last year or last few years of life. So if we have a lot of people mm-hmm. in that all older uh, age bracket, that's going to put pressure on on our health systems. And mm-hmm. there's no really good examples of of how we should reform healthcare mm-hmm. to to offset the the aging population problem. It's certainly true that if you look at the intergenerational reports for Australia, that a large part of the prospective fiscal gap is attributable to healthcare costs. And so this is one thing that we've so far not been very successful in containing. Um, now part of the reason for that in Australia, of course, is that while we means test the pension, we do not means test access to publicly funded healthcare. Um, and so, so even you, if you're a millionaire, you can still rock up at a public hospital and, and get free. Yep, yep. So I can be a millionaire. I can't qualify for the pension, but I can qualify for uh, government-funded health care. Um, so but if you're a millionaire, you probably have private health insurance. Uh, you'd expect so, but uh, there'd be people in, in incomes below that uh, who could afford private health insurance, but nonetheless do not take out private health insurance. And the government has put in place various incentives that are designed to, to nudge people in that direction. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but fundamentally, we still have this problem that uh, we effectively have a, a universal um, model for healthcare coverage. Um, so that's one area that you could tackle to reduce healthcare costs, uh, putting a means test on access to Medicare. Uh, there are problems in doing that, of course, because you can create very high marginal tax rates by putting means tests on government benefits. Um, so you need to be a bit careful as to how you do that. You don't want to create uh, disincentives for labour force participation. Um, and, that, and that's just a trade-off that, that has to be made. And I think the, uh, the American example shows that, you know, going... Uh, more towards the uh, private health insurance might not uh, mm. be, uh, you know, all that, all that optimal. I mean, the U.S. Mm. is spending uh, pretty much double the amount of GDP as other mm. countries on healthcare, and I, I yeah. think uh, there are a few people who would argue that the, the health outs- outcomes in the United States are are superior to countries like Finland and so uh, on. So. Well, actually, there, there's evidence to suggest that uh, U.S. healthcare outcomes. Um, are in fact good relative to other countries. Um, uh, but of course they're, they're paying for this right. And, and part of the question that we face here is um, you know, what these health benefits are actually worth. I mean, how much are you prepared to pay, um, for example, to extend a terminal patient's life by say three months or six months? Um, and so part of the problem in the US is that the incentives are such that uh, basically, you, you you spend that money, um, whereas a, a system that was structured a little bit differently uh, might lead to, to different decision making um, in that regard. So, I mean, of course, voluntarily, you know, I can pay for whatever treatment will extend my life by three or six months. But does the taxpayer have to to uh, make that payment, um, or does? Do private insurers have to be compelled to make that payment? I think you, uh, so. you really need a, a wide debate in, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in the media and, and in the public uh, about well, these issues because yeah, they, yeah. you know, the first reaction uh, of people when when you start talking about you know reducing life or not not extending life mm-hmm. as much as you can potentially. Uh, you know, people start talking yeah. about euthanasia but, and yeah. these sorts of things. But yeah, but well, the issue is more who pay for, pays for it, right? So if I want to spend a million dollars prolonging my, my life for three months, well, well, that's fine. If I'm proposing to spend somebody else's one million dollars to extend my life by three months, uh, that's a different proposition because, um, you, and it's not just the financial cost. I mean, if you're imposing a broader economic cost on society, that's, 
we know there's a correlation between GDP per capita and, and, and well-being and health. So in a way, indirectly, you're imposing uh, costs on others. So, um, so I think that's something that, that needs to be looked at, especially uh, in the US. Okay, I'm, I'm afraid we are out of time, but I would like to thank you very much for your insights and hopefully we'll see some improvement in the, uh, on this front and, and we'll see countries moving towards fiscal sustainability. Dr. Stephen Kirchner, thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Jan. Thank you.